This is the lecture for section 1.4 on primes and unique factorization. When we approach this topic for the first time, there's one question I almost always have to answer. Why do we have to prove that integers can be factored into primes in only one way? After all, everyone knows that 15 is 3 times 5 and there's no other way to do it. And everyone knows that 12 is 2 times 2 times 3 and there's no other way to factor it into primes either. Well, when we start looking at a broader array of systems, we begin to understand that claims of unique factorization are not obvious. Here are some examples. Suppose we were thinking about integer matrices. For instance, we could take the matrix with first row 7, 3 and second 17, 5. It can be factored as we've pictured here. But is that the only way? The answer is no. If I select any matrix B that is invertible, in this case, first row minus 1, 2, and second row 1 minus 1, then its inverse, in this case, also happens to contain only integers, 1, 2, 1, 1 for its rows. Then if I insert B times B inverse into my earlier product for A, I have another factorization for A. And of course, what I could do would be to associate the first two matrices out of these four and the second two out of these four, multiply them together, and get another way of factoring this matrix into two matrices. Well, of course, there's no reason I would have to stop there. I could raise the matrix B to any integer power and raise its inverse to the same integer power and have another way of factoring the matrix A. Therefore, in the system of integer matrices, even if we insist that our factorizations contain only integers, we are not guaranteed of unique factorizations. There are integer matrices, of course, that can't be factored in a nice way, so we might be able to come up with some idea of a prime in this system, but still, we have no guarantee that an integer matrix selected at random can be factored in only one way. Let's look at another example. What about the real numbers? Let's pick the number square root of 2. Is that factorable? Certainly. 2 is equal to 2 times 1 over root 2. And of course, it's 3 times root 2 times 1 third. And of course, it's pi times root 2 over pi. And there's infinitely many ways that we could factor square root of 2 in the real number system. In fact, there isn't even a concept of a prime number in the real number system every real number can be factored in non-trivial ways. So there is no possibility of a theorem of unique prime factorizations in the real. However, when we turn to polynomials with integer coefficients, it turns out that these do admit unique factorizations. x squared plus 3x plus 2, for instance, has a unique factorization into non-factorable polynomials as x plus 2 times x plus 1. So some number systems have unique factorizations and some don't. That is why we must prove claims of unique factorization. Now, if we're going to be talking about unique factorizations into primes, then we need to have a clear idea of what a prime number is. A natural number is called prime if it is greater than 1 and its only factors are 1 in itself. A natural number greater than 1 that is not prime is called composite. The natural number 1, being the multiplicative identity, is in a class by itself. It's neither prime nor composite. It is simply the multiplicative identity. Now I've encountered this question before. Why isn't 1 considered a prime? Well suppose we thought that 1 was a prime. Then we could factor 2 as 2 times 1. Another prime factorization of 2 would be 2 times 1 times 1, and 2 times 1 cubed, and in fact, 2 times 1 to any positive integer power. So if 1 were considered a prime, then nothing would have a unique factorization. So we don't want to call 1 a prime, because if we did, the unique factorization theorem for the natural numbers would be lost. Let's turn then to some basic results concerning the factorization of natural numbers into primes. Here we're considering natural numbers rather than all integers because there's no advantage to considering the possibilities of factoring negative integers. 
Recall, first of all, that we've shown in the previous lessons that if a and b are natural numbers and a divides b, then a must be less than or equal to b. We also have Euclid's lemma. If p is a prime and p divides the product of natural numbers a times b, then either p divides a or p divides b. We'll be using both of these in the sequence. First of all, let's show that there must be infinitely many prime numbers. This turns out to be a surprisingly easy theorem to prove. Suppose to the contrary that there were a finite number of primes. Then we could construct a list of them, p1, p2, through say pn, and then consider the natural number that, would, that is the product of all of the primes plus 1. Let's call that k. Under our assumptions, which we're going to show do not hold, we would then have constructed an integer k that cannot be divided by any prime. If it were the case that some pi divided k, then k could be written in this way. It's some quotient times this prime pi. Then that would tell us that since k is the product of all of the primes plus 1, we could subtract this product of the pi from both sides, obtaining an expression for 1. 1 is q times pi minus the product of our assumed list of all of the primes. But then notice, both this term and this term are divisible by pi. We could factor that out, therefore showing that pi divides 1. But that's a contradiction. No prime can divide 1, because if it did, then the prime would be less than or equal to 1. However, all primes are greater than 1. We conclude then that there are infinitely many primes. This lemma that we just used, that if a and b are natural numbers and a divides b, then a must be less than or equal to b, is one that you should know how to prove. We proved it last time, but let me just recap. If a divides b, then there has to be a quotient for b over a. Let's call it q, which is a natural number. b equals qa. Since q is at least 1, we can set b equal to qa and add 0 in the form of minus a plus a. Subtracting a from both sides, we see that b minus a is equal to q minus 1 times a. Since q is at least 1, this product is at least 0, and that shows that b is greater than or equal to a. Here is a very helpful characterization of prime numbers. Let p be a natural number it's prime if and only if for every product AB. If P divides AB, then it either divides A or it divides B. Let's make sure we understand what this proposition is saying. 6 is not prime, and 6 divides 8 times 9. Does that mean 6 divides either 8 or 9? Well, it certainly doesn't. The factor of 2 in 6 divides the 8, and the factor of 3 in 6 divides the 9. On the other hand, if our divisor is a prime, that cannot happen. 5 divides 15 times 34, but it also divides the 15 without the 34. That's always the case because we can't do what we did with the 6, taking one factor of 5 and putting it into the 15, and another factor of 5 and putting it into the 34, because 5 doesn't have a non-trivial factorization. One direction of this proof is essentially a restatement of Euclid's lemma. If p divides a and b, then either p divides a or it does not. If p does not divide a, since p is prime, the GCD of p and a has to be 1. But then, by Euclid's lemma, p would have to divide b. Now for the other direction. Suppose that p is not a prime. Then it admits some non-trivial factorization, let's say p equals a times b. And now we want to keep in mind that both a and b are strictly greater than 1. We can apply the lemma that we just proved and labeled with a star. Since both a and b divide p, it must be the case that a and b are both less than p. Restating then, p cannot divide a and p cannot divide b either. Consequently, if p is not prime, there are natural numbers greater than 1 satisfying p is equal to a times b, but neither p divides a nor p divides b. Consequently, if p is not a prime, then the conclusion doesn't hold. We have thus shown that p is a prime 
if and only if we have the desired property, P divides AB implies P divides A, or P divides B. Finally, we note that this could be extended by induction. If P is a prime, and P divides any product of natural numbers, then P must divide one of those natural numbers. This completes part one of the lecture.